author of Rewire and Rekill, and development officer at the Pacific Legal Foundation, and new to the show, Daniel Sheehan, a uh, development researcher at Pacific Legal, who uh, is also a uh, member in good standing still uh, of the Libertarian Party. Tell us a little bit about how you became a delegate to the uh, 19 or the 2016 nominating convention of the LP. Well, uh, honestly, it wasn't that hard. It was I found out that there was a candidate who I very much supported and wanted to be part of that. So I was part of the Libertarian Party of San Diego, okay. and so I requested that. Uh, my name be put into consideration to become a delegate. Mm -hmm. And so they had like a pool essentially, which they sent to the Libertarian Party of California, uh, and then they were to select it. I actually didn't make it in as a member of California because they were full. So there were openings in other states, including Alaska. So I am officially a member of the Libertarian Party of Alaska, and I represented Alaska as a delegate to the Libertarian National Convention. That sounds fishy, but uh, <laughs> that is actually how it happened. They they had they had open spots in other ones. I was no, I, I in California, I and then made it in. Yeah. Okay. Now, so how did you get involved in the LP in the first place? Well, I have always had a libertarian philosophy based Every, on based on actually John Stossel. Uh, I, oh, okay. I would I, when I was in high school, I would try and read Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, all sorts of conservative uh, blowhards, essentially. Yeah. And then uh, along the way, I picked up a book by Stossel. And I thought I was reading just a regular conservative. And as I was reading it, I was like, hey, these are interesting ideas I hadn't really thought of before. And the overall idea of freedom and liberty, rather than like just focusing on conservative ideas, focusing on an overall philosophy, an overall concept of liberty just made so much more sense. So recently, Austin Peterson was running on the libertarian, uh, for the libertarian nomination. And seeing someone who was pro-life while also being very focused on limited government was something that really stood out to me. And so I wanted to officially be part of that. So I became involved in the Libertarian Party of San Diego and from there wound up doing what I just told you about, wound up at the Libertarian National Convention. Okay. And uh, the uh, route from the, from the uh, LP as a director of the, of the uh, or as a delegate to the National Convention to uh, a research uh, director at Pacific Legal Foundation. How did, how did that happen? Well, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do was I was enjoying very much being part of something that I believed in. Being a delegate out there, volunteering on political campaigns, trying to help with, you know, well, they were Republicans, but libertarian-leaning Republicans, trying to help on campaigns like that in San Diego. And I really wanted to do that as a career. Mm -hmm. So I went on conservativejobs.com, which is the Heritage Foundation's job board. Right. And they had a position. Uh, they had a lot of positions all throughout the country. But one of them was as a development researcher at Pacific Legal. And I saw that and I was like, hey, I know Pacific Legal. I know Tony Francois. My family's from Sacramento. I can try and vol go up there and potentially do something with that. So I did. I moved back to Sacramento and took this position. And... I'm really enjoying it. Get to fight for liberty and do something that I believe I'm relatively good at. Well, since you joined the organization, one of the uh, initiatives is the is the Red Tape Rollback uh, Congressional Review Act uh, initiative that uh, that uh, PLF has has, uh, has started. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, John. Well, the Red Tape Rollback is actually redtaperollback.com is a website designed to inform people about uh, the Congressional Review Act and um, its effects and also uh, help people go out and identify rules and regulations that might fall under the, the Congressional Review Act. And what the Congressional Review Act, it's from 1999, 96-ish, and it's really been on the back burner. And, and what it states in essence is this, that anytime a, a uh, government agency, let's say the, the EPA comes up with a regulation, they are required to report to Congress within 90 days um, in order for Congress to take a look at the regulation and, and really see if uh, it's following um, the principles of the laws that Congress and only Congress has the right to act um, or create. So. Uh, what has happened, amazingly enough, I know uh, our viewers would be shocked by this, is that the, um, the hundreds, perhaps thousands of rules and regulations that have come out over the last, especially eight years, uh, many of those they've not bothered to, to 
fill out this report to Congress. And what the Congressional Review Act says is if that report's not filed, then basically that rule or regulation is null and void. Um, and so it doesn't matter how far back, in essence, that rule has been promulgated, as long as that report wasn't sent and I think accepted by Congress, then the, the rule can be struck. And, and there are some theories that it not only applies to formal regulations, but interpretations of regulations. And these are the things that have really been the crushing boot on uh, American farmers and ranchers and miners and manufacturers, people trying to make a living. These, um, there'll be a, a law passed by Congress, an independent regulatory agency un will uh, create um, an interpretation of their own rule and then go ahead and enforce it with many times criminal penalties on people. And so this Congressional Review Act uh, will, will allow the current administration just to strike a bunch of those onerous rules. And the red tape rollback.com website is a way for, for people to, it's a research tool and an informative tool. It, it uh, has a copy of the act and it tells people to go about how to go about you know, researching uh, federal regulations and, and reporting them, making uh, fair-minded, liberty-minded people aware of them so they can be struck off the books. The cost of regulation in this country has been estimated to be um, $2 trillion. And um, the rules and regulations that have, that have come out of the Obama administration have been um, heinous, horrendous, and the interpretation of them have been even worse. So this is a, a huge uh, blow for liberty. It's interesting. Uh, the uh, 1996 law was written uh, when uh, a fellow by the name of Todd Gaziano, who is now the executive director of the PLF Washington uh, office, was working as a, I think it was a congressional aide, Congressional uh, aid. In, yeah. in, in Congress. Mm -hmm. And he had a, a part, as congressional aides do, in actually drafting the legislation. A large part. For the Congressional yeah. Review Act. And of course, it's been moribund under the Obama administration. They have no interest in, in doing anything along those lines. And of course, now, with the, the, the great disruptor in office, the, uh, the trumpeter uh, being president, we have a situation where. Uh, there is an interest in rolling back regulations that are uh, problematic. And one really good example of a regulation that uh, is problematic is, is waters of the United States. Let me kind of explain how laws get passed and how administrations come up with rules and regulations. The Congress will say, well, well you know, listening to its uh, constituents, will hear a bad thing is happening. The waters of the United States are being polluted. Rivers. Rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds. We Navigable. Need to, we need waters. to clean them up. So Congress passes a law that says, in essence, fix this thing. Do, uh, do a good thing. Mm. So the law that was passed in, in, in the case of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, was clean up the air and clean up the water. And as it related to water, it said the waters of the United States, navigable waters of the United States, are under the purview, under the regulatory authority of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers. And so Congress gave the regulatory agency the power to flesh out their do-good things uh, idea with rules and regs and uh, enforcement and administration mm -hmm. and so forth. And so over the years, ever since Nixon passed that thing back in the, in the uh, 70s, uh, it's kind of grown like Topsy. One of the largest buildings in Washington, D.C. now is the EPA building, larger than Congress, larger than the White House, larger than, I think, the Pentagon. It's a huge uh, institution as far as meddling in a whole lot of different things. And to give you an example, Waters of the United States is, is a, uh, a regulatory thing that happened really as a result of us at PLF chipping away at EPA water regulations with the, uh, uh, the Rapanos case and the Sackett case, which rolled back some of the authority and power of EPA in regulating waters of the United States when, in fact, no waters of the United States were involved. I think it, I think so what the EPA did is said, well, we need to clear this up. We're going to call Waters of the United States pretty much any land where a drop of water falls, we're now going to call that a tributary of a navigable water and therefore under our regulation. What does that mean for farmers, for businessmen, 
for, for individuals with a, a pond in their backyard, it means that if the EPA decides to do it, they can uh, fine you up to $75,000 per day uh, if they think that you did not request a permit that they think you should have requested to build a pond or to uh, divert an irrigation ditch or to do basically anything on your land. In one case, to plow a field, plow a wheat, uh, plow a wheat field. One guy here in California, John Duarte, has been uh, persecuted by the Army Corps of Engineers for doing nothing more than plowing a, a which, wheat field. Okay. Which is, uh, in the waters of the United States rule itself, uh, exempt from... It's supposed to be. In the law, yeah. it's exempt. In the law, so, it's exempt. So what we have here now is we have this new rule formulated under the Obama administration and about to, be, about to go into effect until PLF and other entities sued to stop it. Now, the POTUS, we've got WOTUS and we've got POTUS. Now, the President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, is saying, well, no, not so fast. We're going to take another look at that rule. So the, the WOTUS case, the challenge to waters of the United States, is in front of the Supreme Court uh, about, you know, it's, it's been accepted by the court, uh, not scheduled for argument yet, but, but, uh, but soon to be. Mm -hmm. So, but now the President is saying, maybe, maybe not. Maybe under Scott Pruitt, we're not going to do that. What's the status there? Well, from what I'm seeing with it, I read through the executive order and mm. a couple of the, uh, the summaries of, of PLF's previous cases. And uh, Reed, who was actually the... Reed Hopper. Reed Hopper, yeah, the, the person in charge of the PLF's cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, that particular case, or, yeah. Or was going to be, but potentially, yeah. yeah. Uh, for the Waters of the United States, he, he published a piece about how uh, PLF may or may not have to drop our cases. Because it may become moot. But it would moot. be in a good way. It may become moot. Right. It might become moot because the executive order could very well replace the need for those cases in the first place. Right. Because according to the executive order, uh, the EPA will be required, and this is in the order itself, they'll be required to reframe and redefine their interpretation of what navigable waters means. Because right now, obviously, they're considering navigable waters to be anything which is ridiculous because navigable waters clearly is supposed to be if you can sail a boat through it. But as Very we were talking about, yeah, a puddle is not a navigable water, but they've essentially Very interpreted it to the point where boat. even a little even a little pond is, they believe they have the enforcement, they have the right to do that. Well, the executive order says that they are required to redefine it back to what Scalia had said was actual navigable waters um, in one of the cases that had already been brought before the Supreme Court. And that is what uh, they're going to be required to do. If they don't redefine, if they don't follow that enforcement, then cases like what Reed was bringing from PLF will be required to keep going. Mm -hmm. But assuming the EPA goes back and follows this executive order, as they are required to do now, essentially by law, um, or I guess it's not a new law as much as an executive order, the enforcement, is, they're supposed to do it. Assuming they do that, PLF will be able to drop their cases. Now, since everybody is obviously in favor of motherhood, apple pie, clean air, and clean water, mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge hue and cry from the left, from the Democrats, about how the uh, EPA is being eviscerated and we're about to uh, see the uh, Cuyahoga River uh, burst into flame once again. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, in fact, today, Fourth uh, of July, the, the, second of, the, the second of March, uh, there was a front page article in the, in the, in the local uh, Sacramento uh, uh, B uh, talking about how, you know, the, extended over onto page two, talking about how terrible everything is going to be with the, I think it's a 20% or something like that, bad, something like that, cutback in personnel at the EPA. Well, of course, if you're not regulating every square inch of the land, you don't need quite as many people at the EPA. And I'm thinking a 20% cutback is probably very modest. Uh, something like an 80% cutback might make more sense if what you're really trying to do is clean up navigable waters, which are pretty much, which, which has pretty much been done. I mean, you know, that, that, that's kind of a mission accomplished sort of thing. I think, Same way with yeah. clean air. It's kind of a mission accomplished sort of thing. I think that's it's why they're going after, that's why they're now going after carbon dioxide because after all, once a bureaucra bureaucracy is in place, you have to keep manufacturing new reasons to exist, otherwise they might uh, shut you down. I think, it's, I think it's very worthwhile to note that the way the law was structured before, um, you know, there's three different branches of the government, but what happens is when when um, these uh, letter agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, 
put out one of these regulations, in essence, they become the, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive. They interpret the rule in a way that they it write becomes the rule, a law. They, they write the rule, the rule, they interpret, and they punish people for it. Yeah. And until some of uh, the well, they Sackett, people and then they punish people. Until Sackett and until Hawks, what happened was they would set up the rule, put the fine in place, and interpret the rule, and then if you objected to it, your only recourse, because it wasn't a law, it was a rule by, by a, an, an independent regulatory agency, was to appeal to that regulatory agency for relief. So you couldn't even appeal to a court of law saying that my parking lot, which is concrete, can't possibly be a water of the United States because it's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Before, if, if the EPA and Corps of Engineers decided that your parking lot in the middle of the Mojave Desert uh, was a water of the United States, no matter how specious or, or, or crazy that decision was, you had no recourse. Yeah, you were making your appeal to the hangman. Yeah, you were the, the person who wrote the law, and it's not a law, but it had, you could be thrown yeah. in jail, you yeah. could be fined, yeah. so it had the effect of law. So the cases that Pacific Legal Foundation won um, had a huge bearing on, on the way the world works, especially if you're uh, somebody who has a job, a farmer, a rancher, a manufacturer, any of the rest of that. And now the, the, the thing that's still important on this is that there, we, there is an argument about uh, which court um, can decide further cases uh, that come up about these rules of the waters of the United States. And it might seem like arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, but what's going to happen is no matter what these, uh, the executive order says, people are still going to be victims of enforcement actions and all the rest of that. And deciding where these can be heard is a huge thing. And that's still on the books. Even if the waters of the United States goes away almost in, in its entirety, um, there's still going to be disagreements between people and, and Pacific and Legal Foundation. And, is, and it's important to be able to appeal yeah. outside the administrative agency to a district, yeah. a federal district. And, and if, it's, if it's just at a circuit court, that's, there's a huge cost involved in that. It has to get through layers to get there. So the idea is that any court should be able to hear one of these, and, and Pacific Legal Foundation is fighting for that. Second, uh, well, uh, the EPA cases that PLF do, uh, does, kind of derive from a, an interest in property rights because mm -hmm. it's people's property rights that are being violated one way or another by a lot of these laws. Another thing that we have done is uh, go after uh, violations of property rights where it is just property rights. Mm -hmm. It's just how property is defined and regulated. And the best example of that is Murr versus uh, Wisconsin, St. Croix County, Wisconsin, which will be argued uh, March in 20th. March, yeah, March 20th, yeah. Uh, before the United States Supreme Court. Tell us about that case. Well, and, and this is a, um, a horrible example of something that happens apparently tens of thousands of times a year in this country. Uh, there's a wonderful family called the Murrs who live in Minnesota, bought uh, a little place Acre on the St. Croix Acre River. And, and what's that? An acre and a quarter. Acre and a quarter on the St. Croix River and, and built a little house. And this is picture Americana, an extended family that summers, they barbecue, they play games, just wonderful family. Um, and as this area grew, and they bought the original piece of property over 40 years ago, they thought, well, this area is going to grow, property values are going to increase, so we're going to buy a second piece of property, a second parcel. One parcel, second parcel. And we're going to buy it. Uh, they bought the lot next door. Lot next door. It, directly next door. We're going to buy it with the idea that land prices are going to go up, and eventually we will sell this second parcel, separate parcel, and use the proceeds to improve the home on the first parcel. And they paid property taxes on two separate parcels for over 40 years, and then went to sell the second parcel, and they were told, no. You can't do that because what we're going to do for purposes of zoning, since it has a common owner, is we're going to consider these two separate parcels that one you paid sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars in property taxes on, and you paid an additional sixty-five, seventy on the other one. We're going to consider them one parcel. So since they're one parcel, um, you can't sell part of this one parcel. So this wonderful family, the Murs, on their own, fought this taking. Basically, the, the Constitution says that the, the government cannot take property from you. 
or take uh, the beneficial use take, of the property. Take the, yeah. In other words, if they make the property have no benefit to you, if it has no financial worth through a ruling or regulation or anything, they're required to compensate you for it. And, and the, the law over the years has said at market rate. But and, because, and the interesting thing here is yeah. they had the, the property assessed mm -hmm. before they went put it on the market at 400000 When the When it got to the taking stage, guess what the government offered them? 10 percent, $40,000. Wow. So that's uh, that's typical government. Yeah. Now, so what has happened is the, the MERS fought this on their own for 10 years, spent $90,000, $100,000 in court fees, and went through all their money, went through all, all and then they asked Pacific Legal Foundation uh, for help. And uh, one of our attorneys, John Groen, um, fine attorney, is going to, it represents the MERS, and on the 20th of uh, March of this year, We'll have oral arguments at the Supreme Court. Now, think about this effect: the, the governments do this kind of zoning manipulation and have used this, um, considering s disparate parcels owned by the same person as one parcel, literally tens of thousands of times throughout the country over the last 30 years. After a case that had to do with Penn Central Railroad, um, and so this is going to have a huge effect on property rights in this country. And that um, what, what's happened is a number of states, California included, because they like getting property for free, which is what happens in this case, and they hate paying people for it, well, are 10%, fighting this. Well, 10%. 10%. Um, 10 cents on the dollar. Yeah, tooth and nail. Um, and so uh, it's uh, anybody who's uh, ever thought about owning a piece of property should have interest in this case. And uh, we have high hopes for success. We talked a little bit about the uh, uh, the POTUS rolling back WOTUS, which we approve of. We kind of like Scott Pruitt uh, in the, his role as the uh, uh, Secretary of the Scotty's uh, our man. Uh, EPA. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, that's the good of the Trump administration. Now we're going to talk about the bad or maybe even the just plain ugly, the border tax plan, the border BTP uh, is supposed to I mean, in effect, does it not just nullify the proposed Trump uh, corporate and individual tax cuts? Um, well, in a roundabout way, or even in a pretty straight line way, yes. I tried to make sense of the arguments for the, the border tax, but basically what's happening is that the idea of the corporate tax cuts, uh, wonderful thing, whenever, um, you know, our, our corporate tax rates in this country are some of the highest in the world, and one of the reasons why so many U.S. Uh, companies um, try to manufacture uh, and do business outside of the United States because if everything else being equal, our corporate tax rates are so high, their costs are much higher here than elsewhere. So the idea of a corporate tax is a wonderful thing. Well, then the Republican Party takes a look at it and says, well, wait a second. When you cut corporate tax, then we're going to lose... They're talking about cutting from 35 percent to 20 percent. 20 percent. We're going to lose a huge amount of tax revenue. And so we don't want to lose this tax revenue because, because, they, because by, they want to spend my it. My God, we, would not, we wouldn't be able to spend as much money. And how terrible would that but be? The, the pork barrel would be smaller if they, they couldn't hand out as much pork and, and pay money to their cronies and all the rest of that. So they've come up with this border tax, which is basically a tariff. It said that if you, you know, if, if you're doing business and you buy something, normally that's a standard business expense and you write off the cost of, of buying raw materials for your business. If you buy them in the U.S., fine. If you buy them from Mexico, bad. You can buy finished product that you use in halfway in your manufacturing cycle. If you buy it in this country, then you can write it off as a business expense. But if you import it from Mexico or Canada or anywhere else, you can't write that off. So, so in other words, the yeah, effect is... It's a tariff. Is, the effect so is, is if you, if you, if you import something... You, you, you cannot write off any of the cost as an expense, so you're paying a tax on 100% of your sales price as opposed to your actual profit margin. That's, that's what they're talking about doing, or whatever the difference is between the, the imported part and the, uh, and the rest of the, you know, the assembly that uh, is done in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, a, a tax, and of course, the Republicans in their static analysis of how taxes work, which is not going to have any effect on anything else. Uh, you know, if the tax goes up 10 percent, well, obviously revenues will go up 10 percent. Mm. Not so much because you have to do a dynamic analysis in order to come up with how tax 
revenue actually happens. And with a border tax adjustment, which is a huge 20% effectively, a 20% import tax, you know, one of three things can happen. One, consumers can pay 20% more for the products. That's probably not going to happen. Two, uh, foreign uh, competitors will also uh, raise their taxes, their tariffs against the United States, in which you've got a, uh, a Mexican standoff or a smooth holly uh, tariff war, which led to not very good things uh, back in the, in the 1930s. Or uh, it's, it's going to be a, a mix of the two, and it's prob that's, that's probably where it's going to end up. Nothing good comes from increasing import or export taxes. Nothing good comes from trade wars. We have a problem. Uh, Depends on your viewpoint. What? Depends on your viewpoint. We have a. If you're in a defense industry, <laughs> or or you are a, a U.S. completely U.S. start to finish manufacturer or producer of anything, then you benefit wonderfully from this rule. But if you're doing business with another country uh, as a supplier, uh, then well, no. what we have here is is a is a perception that the reason why we have a huge unemployment, I, I, well, I'm not going to say unemployment rate, high unemployment rate, because the unemployment rate is messed with mm -hmm. by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What we have is a very large labor, or very small labor force participation rate. Based Historically on, low. Based on, based on, on, on history. Uh, I think it's the, the labor force participation rate is lower now than it's been any time since the late 60s, back, when, back before uh, women started entering the labor force in large numbers. So large numbers of people are, are out of work, whether they're counted as unemployed or not, they're out of work. Yeah. That's being blamed on immigration. It's being blamed on the Mexicans are coming and taking our jobs, when in fact it's not, to that, not that very much that at all. It's automation. Automation is taking our jobs. We are manufacturing more in the United States than we ever have. Record amount of, of manufactured goods are being produced. It's just being done with a lot smaller workforce. That's not because of immigration. It's because of robotics mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. That's causing all kinds of other problems, but those problems are not going to be solved by uh, raising the cost of goods sold through a tariff war. And that's all that Trump is talking about doing that and going after the after the immigrants, which is absolute nonsense. He is proving himself in that respect to be an economic illiterate. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you very much for being part of the show. Well thank you.